Well, good morning, church. Well, good morning, church. One more time. Good morning, church. Yeah, there you go. Got to wake you guys up a little bit. Uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Pete Elliott. I'm one of the pastors here at Resurrection Church. Uh, I was supposed to preach this sermon last week, but I became violently ill. Uh, I really thought I was going to be able to make it, uh, but then all the horrible things that happened with the flu happened last Sunday morning to me at 3 o'clock in the morning. So uh, I am feeling a lot better. I want to say thank you to Pastor Drew, who's our pastor over in Gig Harbor. He actually covered for me last week and wrote his sermon in one day uh, in order to give me a rest. Uh, And so we just want to say a big thank you to him. Uh, All I have to say, it is good to be with you this week, and I'm excited to open up God's Word with you as we continue our Advent series, Waiting. And so as we've been talking about, waiting is not something natural uh, to our modern world. It's basically the exact opposite of everything our technological age values. We have meals that are microwaved for 30 seconds. Uh, Amazon added uh, prime delivery within two days, and then now it's get it same day. It's just crazy how fast they're getting it. Uh, And I get it. Those things aren't bad. Uh, Actually, immediate gratification can be really, really helpful. Trust me, I know as a parent, I have three kids. If I did not have organic fruit in squeezable form, I honestly don't know if we would survive as a family. Um, it's great that we have these gifts and it's great that our society is advancing, but oftentimes that culture of instant gratification or having things immediately can shape us in the wrong way. And I can explain it this way, right? When those squeezable pouches are gone, how do my kids act? Uh, and my kids, they think that I'm a vending machine and I tell them, Hey, the squeezable pouches are gone. And they're like, no. That is impossible, Dad. You are the vending machine that gives me squeezable pouches all the time. They, even my kids, are being shaped by this culture of instant gratification and then viewing me as this vending machine of, Dad, give me the things that are prepared for us all the time. So even though they're good, we have to be honest that that sometimes this immediate gratification that we experience, this dependency on technology, uh, can also take away our ability to patiently wait. But for thousands of years, Christians have intentionally entered this Advent season that we're in right now uh, as a season of waiting. Advent means coming, and it refers to two different occasions. First, when God came to us as Jesus Christ in the incarnation, and then second, when he will return and make all things right. And so the people of God who have lived before Christ waited for him patiently, 3,500 years to be exact, and now we as Christians patiently wait for his return. And in the waiting of Advent, we get to engage in a season of purposeful counterformation, of being formed more by the Spirit of God and less by the Spirit of our age, of being formed to be more like Jesus and less like the world. And so we, as Resurrection Church, as people of God, are waiting. And so today we're going to be talking about what it means to wait for Jesus as our true King. And to do that, we're going to be looking at the story of King David's anointing in 1 Samuel chapter 16. So 1 Samuel is the ninth book of the Bible right after Ruth. Uh, If you you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. We're going to be again in chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Uh, But before we read our text for today, I do want to set the stage for where we are at historically. And so to do that, I'm going to briefly recap 1 Samuel chapters 8 through 15 uh, in story form. And then after that, we'll go ahead and jump into the text. So with that, let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we ask you to be with us, to be present with us. Uh, We are so thankful that you have given us your spirit, uh, who opens our eyes to see your son, Jesus. And so today, we pray that as we read this text in Samuel, and as we study what it means for Jesus to be the true king, uh, that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see him as the beautiful Savior that he is, uh, and that the Holy Spirit would convict our hearts to seek the things that you desire. Uh, It's in your most holy and precious name that we pray, amen. So over the last three weeks, we've been talking about Jesus as these different figures in the Old Testament. We've been talking about him as our savior, uh, our prophet, uh, and our priest. And we looked at the story of Joseph in Genesis. We looked at the story of Aaron in Leviticus, and we looked at the story of Moses in Deuteronomy. 
And so we've been retracing the history of Israel, which God specifically used to save the world, right? Israel was the people of God that he chose to work in and through to bring about salvation for all humanity. The way he does that is he brings forth Jesus Christ, his, the savior of the world through Israel. And so we've been tracing their history. But the point of the history that we're gonna to come to today, uh, as we're talking about waiting for a king, uh, up to this point, there's never actually been a king in Israel. Uh, Israel was a kingless nation, uh, and that was on purpose. So the nation of Israel was actually a theocracy, which is just a word that means it was ruled directly by God. And so God led the people by speaking through human voices. So Israel was led by priests, by prophets, and by judges. People like Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, Deborah, Gideon, and Samuel would listen to God and then lead his people. But these people were not kings. They were handpicked by God to do a specific task. They weren't born into royalty. They weren't born into leadership. They were chosen to lead for a time and then they died and then God chose someone else. There was no lineage. And so in the book of Samuel, we're gonna see that the people of Israel come to a point in their history where they turn to God and they demand a king from him. Look at what 1 Samuel 8, 5 says. It says, now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the other nations. And so Israel, like they often do, look to everyone else and say, we want that. They see that every other nation had a king and so they say, we want a king too. But God warns them. Uh, in that same chapter in 1 Samuel 8, God tells them, hey, if I give you a king, he will exploit you. A king will use your sons for war. He will use your daughters as servants. He will take your nicest properties from you. He's gonna tax you. He's gonna take your food. He's gonna take your finest olives and your finest wines. And so God was completely honest with the people. He says, hey, if I give you a king, if I create this institution of power, it can and will be misused and abused to your disadvantage. And so God assumes the power that he will give will be misused. The people listen to God's warning in Samuel 8, but they do not care one bit. And so God gives them what they ask for. And so over the next two chapters in 9 and 10, we see that a man named Saul becomes king of Israel. Now, the Bible describes Saul in three specific ways. It says three things. First, he comes from a rich, well-loved family. Okay, so Saul has status. Secondly, he was attractive and beautiful. So he has the looks. And then three, he was tall and strong. He had strength. People looked at him and say, that guy could win us battles in war. And so when I think about this, I'm from New England. And so when I was reading the description of Saul, I'm like, okay, so Saul is a Kennedy, you know? He is rich, he is handsome, people know him. I was trying to think of a Northwest family or a Tacoma family that everyone knows and nothing really popped in my head. So I went back to my roots. But you know, the Kennedys, even across America, we know, wow, really good looking family. They have a lot of money. Uh, they went, they were, you know, they went and fought in wars. Just families that you wanna follow because they got the pretty face and they look like they're gonna be good leaders. And so that's what happens. Saul is good social status, looks attractive and is strong. And so the people want him and God tells Samuel, hey, anoint Saul as king. At first, Saul does really well. So Saul protects the people of Israel. He wins multiple battles against Israel's enemies. So he actually pushes back the Philistines along the coast. And then he pushes back the Ammonites and the Moabites to the west and the north. Uh, and overall, he keeps winning battle after battle. And so Saul becomes loved by the people of Israel. Wow, look at he is, he's protecting us like a king should. But some years into his reign, we're told two things which reveal Saul's heart as king. First, he hadn't offered a sacrifice to God in years. And second, he directly disobeys a command from God for his own personal gain. And so as God warned, Saul did not view himself as a servant of God and the people. Rather, he saw his position as king as something that gave him power to be used for his own personal gain. 
So he lacked, Saul lacked the internal character and the internal faith needed to be a true king. And so God responds by rejecting Saul as king of Israel, and he removes his favor from him. Saul is then told his days are numbered, and Samuel is told by God to anoint a new king. And that's where we're entering the story today. Samuel is looking for the new king of Israel. So let's go ahead and read our text. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole thing for us. This is 1 Samuel 16, 1, 13, uh, 1 through 13a. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. And Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. So in the story we just read, in the verses we just read, we get to peer into God's mind as he chooses a king for his people. How does God choose a king for Israel? What is God's criteria for a leader for his people? Uh, Well, before we get to that, I want to actually acknowledge the problem that this text puts before us. And the problem is this. Humans are shallow. We are. As humans, we choose leaders and kings based off of external appearance, beauty, talent, and success. I don't really even need to explain this to you. You know it's true. Humans throughout all time, all cultures, all places have followed and it's served kings based off of the externals. That guy's strong, he can win battles for us. That guy is rich, he can provide for us. It's a very simple way of thinking. We love following humans with pretty faces, big ideas, amazing talent, or extreme confidence. And we still do this today. I said I wasn't going to, I said I didn't need to explain it to you, but let me explain it some more. Uh, There was a recent study by the University of Wisconsin about CEOs and C-suite level executives. And so the study took 700 executives of companies that are traded on the S&P 500, you know, the the big boys. Uh, And they found two things, that the higher the executive ranked on the facial attractiveness index, which I was like, there's got to be a better name for that. You should call it like the pretty predictor or like the beauty barometer. (laughs) Facial attractiveness index just sounds, I guess it does sound scientific. But anyways, they found two things, that the more facially attractive they were, the more they got paid individually and the higher their company stock was traded. So literally, the the bigger the company, uh, the better looking the person at the top of that company. 
There's another study done by the London School of Economics that found out that people, just regular people, correlate external beauty and uh, appearance dress with IQ and intelligence. The study took a sample from all cultures, age groups, and wealth brackets in London and asked them to rank people's intelligence based off of external appearance and dress. And the results were that, in general, the more attractive the person was, the higher their IQ ranked. And then there's also been a bunch of other studies. Study after study has shown that even babies stare at people with symmetrical and attractive faces for longer periods of time. Even cute, innocent babies are shallow jerks. It's the truth. Why? 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 Because we love the external. We love to follow people by looking at what we see right in front of us. Even in the text we just read, right? Even in in 1 Samuel 16, Samuel does the same thing. Samuel as God's prophet. Samuel as a righteous man who the Bible uplifts as one of the pinnacles of faith. He looks at Jesse's sons and he judges them based on externals. Samuel looks at Eliab, the older son, and in verse 6 says, Surely this is God's anointed. Samuel looked at the externals and he assumed he knew God's heart. He assumed he knew who should be king of Israel because of external beauty, appearance, and strength. And so if Samuel struggled with this, we know that we all struggle with this. But as the, as the text informs us, God does not choose kings and leaders based on externals. God doesn't look to external beauty, power, popularity, success, or external talent to choose kings. God looks at the heart. Go ahead and look at verse seven. God speaks to Samuel about Eliab and says these words. These are some of the most famous words in the Old Testament. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God informs Samuel, and he's informing us in this text, that he does not judge humans by externals. God is not like us. God sees us for who we are. He sees everything that we are. Jeremiah 17.10 says these words, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. God looks through us to see the thoughts of our mind, to see the feelings of our heart and our soul. And so God chooses a king and a leader for his people by what only he can see, which is the heart. Now, the heart in ancient Israel was not just the cardiovascular organ. The word used for heart in Hebrew is lev, and the heart was the center of every human. It was what you thought, what you believed, what you felt. Ultimately, it was what you desired and what you loved most intimately. And so this is what God searches for. He is looking for hearts that think about him. He's looking for hearts that believe in him, hearts that feel joy in him, and ultimately hearts that desire and love him. And why? It's because God is goodness, justice, and love itself. He is the perfection of all that is good and beautiful in our world. And so the one who seeks God, the one who seeks him, will naturally seek goodness love and justice. You see, God understands that all externals are fleeting. External beauty and attraction is temporary. It fades. Every human gets old with wrinkles. Uh, Well, except Rob Lowe or Paul Rudd. Uh, Those guys might be the Benjamin Button of real life. Um, Every movie they're in, I'm like, you guys are getting younger. It doesn't seem possible. Uh, But for the rest of us, the rest of us, we eventually lose our youth. I feel this. Um, I just hit a stage in my life where I'm showing teenagers in our youth group photos of me when I had hair and was skinnier. Um, I never thought I'd hit this point this fast in my life. Um, And I showed them those photos, and then I walked into my office the next day, and on my board was, imagine being bald. Uh, The youth group students had written that on my whiteboard. Um, And so... Nothing makes you feel like you're getting older than being around the teenagers of a youth group and having them harass you all day. But anyways, um, I'm feeling this 
fully in my reality. I'm aware that my widow's hill has become a widow's peak. Uh, and all that to say, even though those teens are giving me a hard time, you know what? They're going to lose their hair, and they are going to get wrinkles, and they are going to get old one day, and I will be laughing in my grave uh, when that happens to them. Youth is always fading uh, from the moment we take our first breath. Uh, but all that to say, if it's not youth, it's our strength. External strength fades. All of our muscles eventually atrophy and weaken. One of my favorite athletes, Bill Russell, recently died. As a Celtics fan watching tape of him, I was like, this guy is just amazing. And you can never think of someone in that physical shape getting old and dying. But he did. Human talent and intellect even fades. The older we get, the harder it is to think clearly. Thomas Edison, Tesla, Steve Jobs, they all died. Yes, their intellectual property and patents are still here, but their intellect isn't. Every external that we use to measure success in this world, it all fades with time. But you know what doesn't fade? Internal beauty, character, and virtue. Unlike externals, internal beauty can always grow more and more beautiful. While everything around us fades, the character of our heart can always grow more beautiful each day and every year. Externals are temporary. Internals are forever. And so God is trying to tell us that a king needs more than good looks. A king needs more than good strategy. A king needs more than intellect and a strong body. A king needs a good heart. Who cares if a king is strong if he does not love his people? Who cares if a king is beautiful if he is not wise? Who cares if a king is famous if he is not first humble? Just look at our own broken world that we still experience all the evils that they were experiencing. We still have war. We still have death. We still have sickness. When you look at our broken world, what will save us? Will more good looks save us? Will more intelligence save us? Will more creativity save us? Do we need more smart, more attractive, more successful leaders to finally solve all the world's problems? No. If you ask what will save us, everyone will say the same thing. We need love, humility, sacrifice, courage, joy, peace, justice. External beauty and talent will do nothing to save the world from all the evil we see. Uh, Russian writer Dostoevsky once stated, beauty will save the world. And when he said that, he was not talking about a beautiful landscape image or even a supermodel's face. He was talking about something much, much deeper. And so God looks for beauty not in our appearances, our wealth, our success, our muscular bodies, but in our hearts. Do you love him? Are you humble? Do you sacrifice for others? Do you have the courage to do good even when it costs you? Do you forgive those who hurt you? God judges all of our hearts the same way. Do we love the things he loves and do we do the things he does? And so we see that David in this text is chosen to be God's king for Israel because of his heart. So Samuel goes through all of seven of Jesse's sons and none of them are God's kings. And so then he asks Jesse in verse 11, he says, do you have any more? And that's when Jesse reveals there's one more son. There's one more, David. He's the youngest of them all. He is the runt of the litter. He is the lowest on the totem pole. David is so low, he is relegated to watching the livestock. The other brothers are soldiers and leaders, as Samuel later on tells us. David is just a teenage shepherd boy. But that's exactly what God wants. So Tim Keller uh, quotes a Hebrew scholar named Robert Alter on why God chooses David as king. And Robert Alter makes a really interesting note about this text that we read today, that David is an ancient and male version of our Cinderella myth. David was relegated to domestic chores while the rest of his brothers were invited to the party to be paraded in front of the person with power. But David's time as a shepherd and a caretaker of, of the domestic is exactly what prepares him to lead God's people as king. So David is the tender musician shepherd who would kill to defend his flock, and that's what God wants. 
And notice how God chooses exactly who the world wouldn't, right? The world would have never chosen David to be king. The people of Israel would have never chosen David. You and I would have never chosen David. David was the youngest son of eight. In the ancient world, he would get nothing from his father's inheritance. He had the least life experience. He was the smallest of them all, and still God chooses him. And this is normal of God, right? All throughout the Old Testament, God always chooses the least likely, the cast out, the unlovely, the broken, the barren to bring his salvation. Because God, again, does not look at externals. He looks at the heart. But it is funny to note that the text adds in verse 12, that the, it says this about David. He was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And so ultimately, the text still mentions David's appearance, that he was also handsome himself. He may have been the youngest, but he was not an ugly duckling sibling. And so the question we have to ask is, why does the text do this? The text has been telling us that God doesn't look at externals. And then it's like, hey, here's David's appearance. This is what he looks like. So why does it do this? Well, I think a simple point. Uh, God doesn't want us making the opposite mistake. The solution to trusting externals is not to distrust externals. Uh, It's not to pay pretty people less money or to bar confident people from leadership roles uh, or to assume that beautiful people are unintelligent. Uh, That's not what you should do. That's not the solution, right? Trusting in externals doesn't mean, oh, I should distrust all externals now. The solution, again, I think by pointing out David's appearance is God is always wanting us to tell, test the heart, look to the heart, look to their character. And so the text continues, and handsome young David is anointed as the true king of Israel. God shows David to lead his people, and what does the text tell us? Look at verses 13a. Our text ends with this Phrase And the spirit of God rushed upon David from that day forward. So David, in order to be true king, needed God's help still. Even with his good heart, he still needs God. To be the real king, he needs God because even David is going to fail. David is human just like us. And as king, he's going to do some horrible and evil things as the king of Israel. And he would misuse his power. He would act just like Saul did in certain moments, doing things for his personal benefit. But in those moments of failure, the thing that sets David apart from Saul is that he does not justify his evil. He admits it and he runs back to God. And that's what the Spirit does. The Spirit pushes us back to the one who is lovely, God. The Spirit also throughout 1 Samuel tells us the Spirit is what empowers David to win battles. The Spirit is the one who causes David to use his wealth to better the kingdom. And so David's kingliness is all because of God. Ultimately, it's the Spirit of God that makes David kingly. And so for that, throughout his life, he acts as a good king. And for that, the people love David. David was a good king, and he is remembered as a good king. And God promises David that the savior of the whole world, that the once and for all king, the everlasting king, would be one of his descendants. Jeremiah 23, 5 says this exact thing. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just in the land. You see, David, even though he was a good king, he was not the true king. David's life and anointing as king points us to someone better, Jesus Christ, the everlasting and true king, the king of all kings, God in the flesh. Like David, Jesus was born in the little town of Bethlehem, born as a baby to a virgin mother. Like David, Jesus had the spirit of God rush upon him after he was baptized by John the Baptist. Like David, Jesus was a good shepherd seeking out the lost. Like David, Jesus was anointed with oil as the true king of Israel, but by Mary Magdalene. David's life, everything he experienced, everything we know about him points to the coming of Jesus. 
But unlike David, unlike David, Jesus was not handsome and he did not have beautiful eyes. We are told that Jesus was an average man. Isaiah 53, 2 tells us he, Jesus, had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus, as God, emptied himself of all of his beauty, of all of his power, and all of his wealth, and he took on the form of a humble servant. He didn't come with external beauty, power, and splendor, and strength. But even though Jesus was of average appearance, he still was the most beautiful human to ever live. Jesus, as the God-man, was infinite in beauty, goodness, and power. As a human, he never sinned. He never failed morally. He was always loving, just, and merciful. And in the greatest tragedy in all of human history, Jesus is rejected by his people. He is beaten to a pulp. He is maimed. He is whipped. He is mockingly crowned with thorns, covered with blood and the dust of Jerusalem's streets, And instead of sitting on a throne, he carries a cross and sits on it with nails in his hand. And he is mocked as the false king of the Jews. Jesus hung there naked, ugly, and weak. Why did he do this? Well, Isaiah 52 tells us, it says, he, Jesus, will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. Jesus climbed on that cross to save the world and to shut the mouths of all other kings. You see, almost all other kings and leaders seek to grow their power, grow their success, become more beautiful at the expense of their people. They exploit and they take, but Jesus gives up earthly power, success, and beauty to save you, to save us. Don't you see? Jesus became unlovely so that God would see you as lovely. Jesus gave up his beauty so that you could be seen as beautiful before God. Jesus gave up his power so that you could experience resurrection power. And none of it's because of you. It's all because of him. He is the good and true, beautiful king. That's the gospel. And when we realize that, when we realize that Jesus did that, that Jesus became so ugly and marred and beaten and bruised for us to make us beautiful before God, it changes us. Don't we realize that if the God of the universe views us as beautiful and lovely, we no longer need to seek the acceptance of others through external success, beauty, and power? We can realize that this life is not about having influence and having people gaze at you. It's not about people gazing at me or gazing, looking more and more at me. No, the the point of this life is is about gazing at beautiful King Jesus. Amen? But so often we don't look at King Jesus. We look away to other kings and leaders. We look to people and specifically people like influencers and politicians and brand icons who can expand our own external power, success, and beauty. Influencers, you know, they suck you in because they promise to help you. They promise to expand your own personal success. Politicians overpromise and underdeliver. Brand icons, they promise to give us salvation if only we buy their products. But in reality, many influencers, politicians, and brand icons are doing exactly what kings of old did. They are exploiting you for their own personal gain. Jesus does not. But in all honesty, I think the real reason we don't want to look at Jesus as our king is less about what other kings offer and more about our own hearts. I think we don't like looking at Jesus because it reminds us that the cross is true beauty. And it's hard for us to admit that because if the cross is true beauty, that makes life hard. 
It means life isn't about me, it's about others. So the idea of serving Jesus as a king is difficult because it actually costs us something. Jesus' kingdom is not focused on external success, glory, beauty, and power. His kingdom is all about the heart, the internals. And so it requires that we use our wealth, our power, our success to serve others. But here's the twist, right? By following Jesus as king, you may be giving up external wealth, power, and success, but you are gaining an eternal inheritance, resurrection power, and a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, in the kingdom where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Our hearts are always what God has been after. And so when Jesus grips your heart, you will find that, that a beauty that never fades, a treasure that can never be corrupted, and a kingdom that cannot be destroyed. So while the kingdom of this world tells you to climb the social ladder and to be hospitable and to kind to those who can improve your social status, Jesus' kingdom says, what you do to the least of these, you have done to me, Matthew 25, 40. While the kingdom of this world tells you to use your strength and your energy to fight and take revenge on your enemies, Jesus' kingdom says, love your enemies and pray for those who assault you, Matthew 5, 44. While the kingdom of this world tells you to promote yourself, uh, to, to make other people like you by telling them the good things you do, Jesus' kingdom says not to let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, Matthew 6, 3. Jesus is saying there, if you do a good deed, do it because it's good, not because it makes you look good. And lastly, while the kingdom of the world tells you that you need to care for yourself first and foremost to get yours, so to speak, Jesus' kingdom says the last shall be first and the first last. Matthew 20, 19. This is the kingdom we are a part of as Christians, a kingdom of internal love of God, of having a heart that seeks him more than anything in this world, a heart that would give up all things if it could have Jesus. And if you're not a Christian yet, this is the kingdom you're invited to. If only we submit to King Jesus, then we will grow in true beauty, even while everything external fades. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he is the eternal and everlasting king. We thank you that you chose to send him to us and that he emptied himself of all his power, all of his glory, all of his beauty. We thank you that he climbed on the cross and became so disfigured that we didn't even recognize him. We thank you that by him giving up all of his beauty and all of his glory and all of his honor, that you then allow us to partake in your own kingdom, Lord. Please let that truth grip every single heart in here. that the God of the universe came down to us as one of us so that we might have life and have it more abundantly in him. So Lord, we pray that today as we leave that we would focus our hearts on you, that we would focus our hearts on growing to become more like you, that we would grow in character and virtue, that we would grow to become more like you in goodness in love and in justice. And Lord, that we would use our own power, our own success, our own wealth to serve others as you have served us. And in doing so, be a part of your kingdom. God, we pray that you would give us your Holy Spirit, empower us to do this this week. It's in your most holy and precious name we pray, amen. Well, at this time, we're gonna respond